Hi there, Mike Barger, everybody's favorite mountain guide, one more time. Um, I just got some mail, and uh, I actually got a couple where people are asking, how do we dress for the outdoors, like what are, for the activities that we do? Um, for the moment, I'm just going to address like ice climbing, because that's the season that we're in, and it's a very difficult uh, thing to dress for if you're doing like a big ice climb or a big activity like that, because it varies from being really, really active and, and really super heated to periods where you could be standing at 20 below for hours. And uh, to dress for those two activities or those two extremes with the same clothing um, can be tough sometimes. And I could give it a shot, but I know somebody who is better at it than I am or can at least lay the foundation down for you. And then uh, why don't we just come back and we'll talk a little bit more and finish this thing off. Uh, so here it is. I'm going to take you to visit my buddy John Price. All right, folks. Well, here we are. I'm with uh, John Price. And John's been sent by the Australian government to assert my <laughs> throne as the king ice climber of Banff. And uh, he's, he's almost a prince now. But he's still a knave as far as I'm concerned. He hasn't got the vials. <laughs> But what he does has, he has some information for you about layering for ice climbing, which uh, I could do that to you, but I would totally bosh the job. So I'm going to let John, and don't let the Australian accent fool you. Uh, he's been tutored by the uh, Aussie Gov on, uh, on layering and clothing and ice climbing, right? And I think he trained over in New Zealand, is that right? That's right, two years, yeah. Two years, eh, years before yeah. he came to the big times? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. We well, you're in the big leagues now, so... Uh, <laughs> we'll see how long you last. Yeah. All right. Okay. So I, why don't you just take it away and explain to these fine folks like what you would wear on a nice typical climb, day. A typical day. Sure. And you know, and anything you know, anything from whatever zero up to minus twenty-five. Yeah. Sort of thing. The, the kind of conditions we get here in the Rockies. Yep. Any colder than minus twenty-five, you really shouldn't be ice climbing. If you're out ice climbing, mm. you, you've got a problem. Great. Well, take it away, John. Cool. Yeah. So um, my typical uh, layering system for the Rockies pretty much comprises of four pieces. That's like the base layer, the mid layer, so the fleece, uh, the shell, so what's protecting you from the elements, and then what's known as the belay jacket, the warm jacket you put on when you're standing around, putting your gear on, belaying, etc. So the first piece we'll look at is the, the base layer, so that's the piece next to your skin. Um, for me, that's always a synthetic. And that's predominantly because I run hot, I sweat a lot. So I want a synthetic that's going to dry quick and wick really well, meaning it's going to move the uh, moisture my body's creating away from my skin and onto the outer layers. So that's uh, like a, a lightweight synthetic t-shirt, like f nicely form fitting. So it's uh, not too bulky under the other layers. Next piece, what the mid layer is, is um, slightly Thicker, again, synthetic piece. I always like to have a hood on this guy, which I uh, always keep on and have the helmet over the top, unless it's an approach or sitting around zero degrees. Uh, and this is also wicking, it's really fast drying, but most of all, highly breathable. And uh, that's really important when you're running hot and you, you know, you climb the steep pitch of ice, you're gonna get pretty sweaty. And if this thing isn't breathable, then you're gonna stay wet all day. Next piece will be for me is the shell. Some people might layer more before they put on a shell, especially in minus 15 or 20, but I use an insulated shell, the Patagonia North Wall jacket. So it actually has like a high loft fleece built into the shell. So this shell, although it's not technically waterproof, a good soft shell should be functionally wind, highly wind resistant and uh, water resistant. If it starts getting too windproof and too water resistant, then you're losing the main strength of a soft shell, which is really breathability. So that's what I like to use for shell. And then, like I mentioned before, the belay jacket. It was, uh, for me, even on the colder days, it's usually maxes out around a 100 gram Primaloft jacket, synthetic belay jacket. I like synthetics because uh, even on the wet days, if this gets wet, it's still gonna keep you warm. Unlike with down, if down gets wet, it's going to lose all, essentially all of its uh, thermal properties and you're going, to get, you're going to get cold pretty quickly, it's going to be useless. Nice thing about this is 
like Joe said, or Mike, if you're uh, climbing around the minus 25 or minus 20 and this is your belay jacket we've been standing around in, for me I'll just keep this on and then second the pitch or climb the pitch in the belay jacket. If it's really cold, again, keeping this on over the shell and then you know, swinging leads, leading the next pitch in the belay jacket. Being synthetic, you have that option. Doesn't matter if it's getting wet, um, getting frozen down, I'm getting a little bit more worried. The other nice thing about a uh, synthetic belay jacket is they usually all have the option these days to pack up into a small stuff sack. Uh, this is really nice on multi-pitch routes where you don't want to carry a pack, you know, but you want your belay jacket. So you clip your spare gloves and your harness, belay jacket on the pack on the back, and you're good to go. With bigger down jackets, usually it's usually resorting to having to carry a small pack. So. Yeah, that's my typical setup for an ins using an insulated shell. If I wasn't using a shell that was insulated, uh, and like like most climbers will be, you're just using a true shell, um, which is you know water resistant uh, and wind resistant. Uh, unless it's a hard shell, then it's fully windproof, like a Gore-Tex. Um, I'll usually be beefing my fleece and my mid layer up a bit, so something a little bit thicker. You know, the R1 hoodie. Is uh, like got a bit of a cult following these days. Patagonia made this this form-fitting climbing fleece, and uh, that's usually the go-to for most climbers and ski tourists. Highly breathable, um, very quick drying, very nice piece. So yeah, that's the typical setup. And for the pants, pretty simple really. Uh, I'd use like a, again a synthetic tight fitting, highly breathable, highly quick drying synthetic pant. Pretty lightweight, and I'll usually only use lightweight long johns. And then if it's really cold days, and a lot of standing around, like a slower, harder climb, probably put on two pairs. And then on top of those guys, I'll have a soft shell pant. And every soft shell pant should be, uh, you know, highly water resistant and wind resistant. Again, Gore-Tex is always an option for climbers if they want a bit more protection, but for me, someone who runs hot and sweats a lot, it's just too, uh, it's not breathable enough, and I'm getting wet on the inside from the Gore-Tex. So that's why I'll always use soft shells. On longer, more committing climbs, I might take a Gore-Tex hard shell, um, but pretty rarely if your soft shell is, is bomb-proof. All right. Right from the kangaroo's mouth, folks. <laughs> you got the... Uh... That's the layering system. Yeah, I pretty much do the same thing. Uh, I've gone to the, the soft shell. Uh, I just find it the same, for the same reasons. It's yep. just too warm. Yep. You know, there, there are certain situations where Gore-Tex is, mm -hmm. but, but generally those are in the big mountains or high mountains. Yeah, when the commitment level's a little bit higher. Yeah. In the Rockies, you, you know, and you're climbing. Just, yeah, you can get back to the car. Close to the road a lot of the time, yeah. exactly. Um, you know, a lot of people do wear Gore-Tex and it just depends on who you are and, you know, if you sweat a lot and if you know you're going to be standing around for a lot of the time and it's going to be a warmer, maybe a wetter day, then maybe a good option. Great. Right. Yeah. Well, that's fine. Well, thank you very much. Hey, no worries. And, it, hey, folks, just to uh, let you know, my life is better than his vacation. <laughs> All right. Cheers, Mike. Okay. Thanks. That's the way you go. Cool. Good. How was that? Was that all right? <laughs> so, that's John, and... Uh, that's a pretty good overview of the way you dress for these activities. The thing you got to keep in mind, you know, are I start out and I get out of the car and I just don't like being cold. And so I'll overdress a little bit, but I put on a layer that I'm prepared to take off in 10, 15 or 20 minutes after I've started to heat up and I'm walking uphill to uh, whatever activity it is that I'm going to be doing. So, um, a, the layers of Gore-Tex, I, I have two basic layers here. Um, I have this really super light and I wear this ice climbing quite a bit where I'll put all my sort of insulating layers underneath it and then I just put a super light waterproof shell over top of it, waterproof windproof. And uh, that'll keep me quite warm and if I open up the vents, this one's not vented all that much, but um, open up the front, it'll provide, you know, pretty reasonable uh, protection from the elements. And then I have this full-on storm jacket, and it's quite a bit heavier. doesn't pack away near so well. But I also use this quite commonly in ice climbing where it's, it's, I'm exposed to uh, 
you know, like flowing water or extreme winds, and I need to really shell up and, and bundle up. And what I found is uh, if I throw a few layers underneath this, because um, I can't afford to take, you know, a, a big pack with a bunch of uh, puppies in, in with me, um, this works quite well. These jackets, like this, you know, this type of jacket, this one particularly from Arteryx is seven or eight hundred dollars. Uh, and, but if you take care of it and wash it regularly, and uh, it'll last you quite a long time. Now, I've heard people say, oh, well, seven, eight hundred dollars, that's an awful lot. And it is an awful lot of money if you're using it to go walk your dog in Central Park. But um, when I was up on the side of Murchison a couple of years ago, and I noticed, you know, I'm exposed up there. The wind is just howling. There's lots of flowing water and lots of water in the air. And by the time the client got up to me, I was encased from head to toe basically in about a quarter inch of ice and you know I'm just shelled up and just my eyes are exposed to the whole thing and I was completely comfortable you know at 15 below standing there for an hour and a half um, literally a ice from top to bottom so in that kind of environment I don't care, seven hundred dollars doesn't seem like all that kind of that much money so you have to really decide uh, you know what you're using it for and, and where you're taking it um, the other sort of bomb proof layer, I don't use this as much because most of the time I'll wear this kind of shoulder layer. These, uh, and like John suggested, and they're very breathable. Um, they shed most of the time water that and snow. They'll shed snow and, and a certain amount of water. Uh, they don't soak in that well and they add some insulation value. The layers I put underneath it will really depend on, on how cold it is. So if it's, you know, minus five or ten or lower then I'll probably put a really super thin layer of uh, polypro underwear and then I'll put a slightly thicker layer um, Patagonia's got some good layers for that so does Arteryx and then I'll throw the shoulder overneath and then I'll start layering over top of that there are times though when um, I'm going to be in a lot of howling winds and and a lot of extreme weather and I need more more protection from the elements and so I have this sort of bib level, uh, you know, bib level Gore-Tex pant. The important thing about these are they have the full side zip so that when I'm actively moving from point to point or place to place, I want to be able to open this up and let the moisture uh, get out and let it cool off and let all the hot air. So I, I'm not getting soaked from the inside as John had suggested, uh, which can happen. Um, the materials these days are pretty good. As far as the downs, I very rarely take a down, you know, like this old, uh, this one's been around the block. If this thing could talk, it'd curl your hair. Uh, but this is kind of like my big wall jacket. It would be my sleeping bag, an uncomfortable sleeping bag, or if I had to spend a night out on a cliffside. Another bigger one yet would be this thing. This is, I've worn to the Yukon a few times where, you know, you wake up and it's 45 below and that's the warm part of the day. So you need something that goes over top of all your other layers. That's a complete layer in itself. But they're not too practical to carry along. I also, like John, I have the uh, synthetic and this is basically my belay jacket. And it works very well. I just throw it over top of all my layers. You know, if I'm just belaying at the crag or at Hafner Creek or something like that, um, I can just bring this along and throw it throw it over. It's uh, fairly bulky, but it'll fit into a pack. It'll stuff into a, you know a pack if you have to take it with you. And when it's 20 below, like around Christmas time when I was climbing, um, like did hydrophobia and a couple other routes, and I I would just literally this would be my shell, and it's it's pretty resistant. It's wind resistant, uh, water resistant, you know for the most part, uh, and has good insulation. So, but for the Nine times out of ten, this is just kind of my over overburdened belay jacket, right? And that's the key thing. And then, uh, you know, now the other layers that I'll wear would be, you know, as John suggested, just layering the, the clothing outwards. But being able to get in so that I can open it up and vent the stuff out while I'm moving. Because you get surprisingly active sometimes, uh, especially on approaches where they can be two or three hours long and a couple thousand feet higher. And you're carrying your big pack full of ropes and climbing gear and, uh, and equipment. Um, you can really, really heat up. And if you're not dressed correctly and allow that moisture to get out of your body and that heat to vent out, you can make yourself for quite an uncomfortable day later. Uh, but you're living in the era of good clothing, you guys. Um, I'd like to thank 
my two main suppliers these days. I don't get they don't give me clothing for free, but they give me a good enough deal that on my minimum wage, uh, I can afford it. I can afford so uh, Arteryx and Patagonia. Thank you guys. I've been using them for 25, 30 years, and I even have some old. Somewhere in here, there's a bunch of old Chenard pitons. I think this is one. This is handcrafted by uh, Yvonne Chenard before Patagonia even existed. So, that's it for uh, this episode of Climbing Tools. And hopefully we'll get back to you real quickly with another episode. Perhaps Mike's Mail will be coming next. Oh yeah, and remember... <laughs> That's right. My life is better than your vacation. <laughs>